Okay, so today I'm going to talk about quantum optics and specifically quantum entanglement. And it's it's an experiment in the optics lab that you have the option of doing if you take advanced lab. And so I, I haven't dwelt too much on this topic because it's one of the few things that you'll you'll get a second shot at in person, hopefully, if you're if you're going to be around uh, next next year. And uh, for I think this is one of the most most interesting aspects of quantum mechanics. It's sort of for for the a few students who who choose to go this route in in optics lab in the past. They've and they've really dove into the kind of deeper meaning behind this experiment. They found it to be one of the one of the more interesting experiments. And uh, I'm going to talk I'm going to talk about this. And I I've I've given lots of presentations about this in kind of physics colloquia, physics talks, and and other kind of talks to, to other groups. So I have some nice slides that I'm going to show. But I really encourage you to, to stop and ask a lot of questions. And, and I'm only going to go through maybe 20 minutes of, of slides, and then we'll be done, uh, unless people ask good questions, in which case we can discuss you know, some, I don't know, maybe more philosophical issues of quantum mechanics and quantum entanglement and what it means and how, how it's measured in the lab in this, in this pretty straightforward straightforward way in our optics lab, which again, like I said, you can have the option of doing an advanced lab. All right, so let me share, let me share a screen here and start the presentation. All right, so um, this is, this is me with a giant telescope. Let me see if I have a pointer, yeah. So this is a one meter in diameter telescope and it's, it's at Table Mountain, which is a, a jet propulsion lab, NASA JPL facility. And my first summer here, uh, two summer students, Calvin Leung and Amy Brown, built this black box, which uh, is attached to the back of the telescope. Maybe I'll uh, show a little bit of that um, if we have some time at the end. And it, it basically took incoming light from distant quasars and measured individual photons that had been traveling for billions of years, basically more uh, in some cases, 90% of the age of the universe, these photons have been freely, freely streaming toward us. And we captured them and uh, did some rudimentary spectrum measurement and tagged their arrival time. And, and the, the reason for doing that has, has a little bit to do with quantum entanglement. These photons themselves weren't entangled, or if they were, it, it, didn't, it didn't matter uh, for our purposes, but we're using it to test some interesting aspects of quantum entanglement. So let me, let me spend a lot of time talking about the, the quantum entanglement part of this experiment and quantum entanglement in general. So we've, we've talked about polarization and various physical mechanisms that can polarize light. So when we talked about the, the Fresnel relations, we talked about how the transmission and reflection coefficients depend on the polarization. The boundary conditions of Maxwell's equations are slightly different for reflected and transmitted light. And so if you have an unpolarized source, you know, a, a source coming in reflecting off of this glass plate that that's randomly polarized or you know, at any instant can randomly contain any, uh, any polarization, like from a, an incandescent light bulb or the sun, um, it comes in and hits this glass. And if you, if you have it coming in at the right angle, it'll come out polarized in one direction. And you know, I talked about this as, as a physical process having to do with the boundary conditions. And so when we start thinking about this photon by photon by photon, each photon is, uh, we can think about it as being assigned some, some uh, polarization. And whether the photon bounces off the glass or goes through the glass, depends on its quantum state. And you can have a superposition state of horizontally polarized and vertically polarized. You know, if you, with the right coefficients, that's just diagonally polarized light. And uh, this process of bouncing off the glass is one way of uh, uh, separating out the, the vertical polarization, which will go straight through from the horizontal polarization which will, well, actually, the, sorry, the vertical polarization uh, 
yeah, the, the vertical polarization will go straight through, and all that's left is horizontal polarization. So some of the horizontal polarization also goes through, but the stuff that's out here, if you detect it with a photodetector, you know for sure that it's horizontally polarized. So the question is, this combination of uh, separating out the polarization with some physical process and detecting the photon, uh, that, that's, that's a quantum measurement. We're, we're asking what, what fraction of this, of this light is, is horizontally polarized. And again, photon by photon, uh, this, it's not like half of a photon comes through. If you look at this light with a photomultiplier tube, or these days it would be an avalanche photodiode, uh, and, and you're, you're measuring what comes off, you, you see sort of noise, 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 and then you get a big pulse, noise, 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 noise. And these pulses come in, in discrete, discrete sizes. And maybe I'll, I'll ask a question to make this slightly interactive. Why, why are these pulses negative for a photomultiplier tube? If you remember from brief discussions back in uh, Physics 51, how a photomultiplier tube works, it uses the photoelectric effect. So what, what comes off when, uh, when light hits a piece of metal? Electrons. Electrons, yeah, and they're negatively charged. So, so that's why um, and the, the photomultiplier tube uses this process of a single photon coming in and releasing an electron. That electron is in a really strong electric field and it accelerates and bashes into another plate, which releases more electrons. And those electrons are in a strong electric field and they get accelerated and bash into another plate. And, and the process continues kind of you know, exponentially amplifying the, the single electron that came off. But if no photon comes through, then, then you don't see much. The amplifier that's looking just measures this noise. So um, this is, this is a uh, uh, kind of evidence that, that light comes in quantized, quantized units. Um, and then normally, if I were to do this in person, I would, I would do what I did in, the, in one of the lecture videos, which is to take my, my polarized sunglasses and show you the screen. And so let me see if I can do that. Uh, let me maybe stop sharing and is I tried this before and it kind of semi worked, but let me see if I point the camera toward the screen and oops, stop sharing. Point the camera toward the screen here. Oh, I've since moved all my cords. Great. And I take my polarized sunglasses. Um, the LCD screen of my laptop is is polarized, and so it depends on how I have these, uh, these sunglasses oriented with respect to the screen. Now, the, the sunglasses are not amazing polarizers. When they're letting through light, they still block some of the light. They're still sunglasses. But when they're blocking the light, they, they block you know, 99 point something percent of the light. It's, it's quite, uh, quite difficult to see, to see anything through, through when they're blocking. And so, this is another way of, of measuring polarization. And you could also think about it as a uh, physical process where the, the light is hitting the sunglasses and it's either going through the sunglasses or it's getting blocked by the sunglasses. Um, oops, let me share the screen again. Uh, okay, and kind of the best demonstration of this and the one we use in the lab is a polarizing beam splitter. And in the polarization video, I, I showed you a couple of these and I showed you how they worked. And with a polarizing beam splitter, you put in unpolarized light or light of some arbitrary polarization, say 45 degrees. And classically, if you send in 45 degree polarized light, half of it would come out this way and be vertically polarized, half of it would reflect and half of it would go through, it would transmit, and it would be horizontally polarized. That's in terms of intensity. Um, but quantum mechanically, if you put in 45 degree polarized light, there's, uh, there's some probability, a 50% probability that the light comes out this way and it's vertically polarized, and a 50% probability that the light comes out this way 
and it's horizontally polarized. So again, it seems like there's something physical going on here that takes 45 degree light and there's some physical measurement process that's happening in the beam splitter that's separating out the, the horizontal from the vertical uh, as it goes into the detector. And just like with classical intensity, as you rotate this polarization angle through, say you define zero degrees as horizontal, as you rotate uh, through increasing angle, the intensity we saw went like cosine squared of, of the angle. Um, but here in quantum mechanics, it's the probability that the photon goes through, the probability that your detector will click, the probability that your photomultiplier will make a, uh, make a little uh, dip when it, when it uh, releases its shower of electrons. That probability goes like cosine squared of the angle. And so if you send in 45 degree polarized light, you can look up what cosine squared looks like and uh, it's 50%. And it's, uh, yeah, it goes from, you know, 100% probability when, when you're horizontal, smoothly down to 0% probability when your polarization is vertical. All right, so, you know, historically people have thought about mechanisms for, for this quantum mechanical wave function collapse. And the first, the first thought that that they or maybe you might have is that measurement, like you know, going through one of these beam splitters and then into detectors, measurement is some complicated local process. We you know maybe we can't describe it in great detail, uh, but at least the the quantum mechanical wave function describes what happens in terms of probabilities. Measurement is some physical process that that whose net result is some probability. And this, this way of thinking, I think, is, is pretty common to those who haven't thought about this much or haven't thought about entanglement. But this is not, this is not what, what can happen. This is not really what's going on. And this is why we're really careful in quantum mechanics to the, the way we talk about measurements and, and other things. And for single photons, there is no, there is no way to distinguish these, these things. It could be that measurement is some complicated local process that's doing this. Um, but it was really first pointed out by these, these three physicists in 1935, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. Uh, and their paper is usually given the name EPR. And this is really where the concept of entanglement uh, start, started. And, and they, they were pointing out that uh, the, the wave function, the quantum mechanical wave function itself uh, seems it's, it seems like uh, there's a little bit more going on there and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll dive into a little bit more detail. So back in 1935, they weren't really thinking about polarization of photons. They weren't even really thinking about electron spins, which is how that's typically talked about today. They were thinking about uh, complicated joint states of position and momentum. Uh, but for, for illustration today, either uh, we work with electron spin or we work with uh, polarization of light both of which have, have the same, same math. And, uh, and so what we have in our, in our optics lab is this setup. We have uh, the ability to generate uh, entangled light, quantum mechanically entangled light. And it really explore these questions about what measurement in quantum mechanics can mean and what it cannot mean. And so the setup is as there's some ultraviolet pump laser and it shines into a, uh, a special crystal of, it's called uh, beta barium borate, I think, BBO, beta barium. I'll have to look that up. Um, it shines into this special, special crystal. And this crystal is, is nonlinear in the sense that the, uh, the, the way the electrons in the material move around is not just linearly proportional to the applied electric field. So normally when you double the electric field, the atoms move twice as far. And so if you, if you jiggle the electrons with some, some amplitude and some intensity and some frequency of light, the electrons will jiggle with a proportional amplitude uh, leading to a proportional intensity and uh, you know, the same, at the same frequency. For a nonlinear crystal, if the electrons aren't jiggling proportionally. So say, say they're on 
they're on springs that, that get tighter and tighter and tighter as they get stretched. And so as, as the amplitude of the, I'm gonna draw a little sine wave here, as the amplitude of the electric field goes up and up and up and up in its sine wave pattern, the, the crystal atoms themselves at first also proportionally go up, but eventually maybe they level off. They don't quite go up as, as strongly. And so the, the sine waves kind of get flattened out a little bit on the top. And if you were to decompose that into Fourier components, the shape of that wave is no longer a pure tone. It is a tone made up of the fundamental and its harmonics. And, and so this is a, a nonlinear crystal. And through uh, some, uh, uh, some other, other processes, uh, kind of time, time reversed versions of that process, um, one, one of the effects that this kind of nonlinear crystal has is you can shine in ultraviolet light and occasionally it will convert into two infrared photons. And here they're drawn in different colors just to distinguish them. But they're both, they're both infrared. They're at half the frequency. Uh, but, but these infrared photons are entangled in the, in the following sense. If you shine in, at least for our crystal, if you shine in a vertically polarized light, you get two horizontally polarized photons out. If you shine in a horizontally polarized light, you get two vertically polarized photons out. And if you shine in a 45 degree polarized light, which is, uh, which is what we manipulate the, the laser's polarization to be in the lab, a 45 degree polarization is one over square root of two vertical and one over square root of two horizontal. And so the vertical ultraviolet light converts into horizontally two horizontally polarized infrared lights and the horizontally polarized light converts into two vertically polarized uh, infrared, but the superposition is, is maintained. The phase relationship between these two is maintained. It's not just that 50% of the time it does this and 50% of the time it does that. It's really quantum mechanically, um, you, you get the superposition of having two horizontally polarized infrared photons plus the quantum mechanical uh, cat of having two vertically polarized uh, infrared photons. And this is an entangled state, just like the spin singlet state is an entangled state in, in uh, uh, if we were dealing with spins. And so I'm not gonna go into the, the kind of material physics and light photon interaction and kind of the quantum field theory uh, for electromagnetism behind what, what really needs to happen in the guts of this crystal. But this is something that we can verify in the lab by making various measurements. And you shine ultraviolet light in of certain polarizations and different polarizations come out in, in certain predictable patterns and we can measure that. So let me show you a picture. Oh, so, um, and let me tell you a fact about this, about this state before I show you the picture. So a fact about this state is if we measure each of these photons and we measure their polarization and we send photon A through a polarizer at some angle and we send photon B through a polarizer at some different angle separated by delta theta, the probability that the same thing happens, so either both photons go through the sunglasses or both get absorbed or back in the beam splitter case, both photons go through the beam splitter or both photons reflect off the beam splitter. The probability that the same thing happens for this particular quantum mechanical state is cosine squared of the angle difference. So if you had two, two of these Q beam splitters that were just oriented parallel to the table, you just set them down on the table, um, the, the delta theta would be zero. And for every, every ultraviolet photon that happened to convert to two infrared photons. And, and this only happens like one in, a, one in a million times or something. Uh, most of the ultraviolet light just goes straight through. It's mostly a clear looking crystal. Uh, for, for those rare photons that do happen to convert and they do come off at a different angle so we can separate them out. Um, they would either both go through their respective beam splitters as, and they would act as horizontally polarized photons, or they would both reflect from their respective beam splitters. They would both act as vertical, vertically polarized photons. 
and that's for delta theta equals zero. And I'll show you a picture on the next slide, and I'll show you how we can change theta a and theta b separately and, and really map this out. And so here's, here's a picture looking down the laser. So the laser is somewhere behind where I'm taking the picture. It's just a box. It doesn't look very exciting. Um, this out of focus, uh, out of focus ring here. Oh, and the light comes out of the laser. Uh, I think it comes out horizontally polarized. This ring here with the uh, angles labeled, this is a half wave plate that rotates the polarization to be 45 degrees. This, this thing here is uh, uh, just a piece of quartz that, that just makes sure that the phase is correct between the, the two components that are rotated at 45 degrees. And in the center here, this is where the magic happens. This is the BBO crystal. So it's pretty small. It's like a, you know, a, a millimeter or two by a millimeter or two in this mount. And then what comes out is mo most of the, the ultraviolet light just keeps going straight and just gets absorbed by this uh, absorber here. But occasionally, you know, one in a million times or one in, it's either one in a million or one in 10 to the 12th. I can't remember. It's the amplitude or the intensity. Uh, very rarely, a pair of infrared photons gets created and they go into these, these, uh, uh, these are each half wave plates for the infrared wavelength. And so we can rotate rotate one independently of the other. And then behind these infrared wave plates, there's a polarizing beam splitter, which you can't see. And there are four detectors. There's one detector where the light goes straight through. There's one detector where it reflects. Uh, so these aren't the detectors. They're actually uh, fiber, fiber optic cables that go to the detectors. And then on the other side, there's there's a fiber optic cable that goes to a detector uh, back here where the infrared light goes through and a fiber optic cable where the infrared light uh, goes to a detector where it reflects. So, so rather than rotating the, the polarizing beam splitter and these two fiber couplers, rather than rotating all three of those things together, we rotate the photon and then detect it with the, with the detectors like this. Um, Another way to do it would be to just skip all the polarizing beam splitter and everything and just re replace, replace this halfway plate with a polarizer. Uh, and then you would sort of more directly be, be performing the experiment I described where, uh, oops, why, is it, why don't I get the cosine squared? Yeah, where, where the probability that uh, they would go through the polarizer is, is uh, delta theta. This is a, you know, one, and, and we do that experiment too, which is this one's a little bit cleaner because here you can actually measure the photons that go through and the photons that reflect. And so, uh, you know, up to the efficiency of the detector, every photon that goes into the system can get detected. And then what we do is we look for, for coincidences. So there's a lot of stray infrared light in the room, but we look for times when we detect a photon from the right side, either in either channel, uh, at within say 10 nanoseconds of when we detect a photon in this channel. And it's very rare that background light will, will, uh, will arrive on the left side and on the right side within 10 nanoseconds of each other for the levels of, of light that are in the dark room. And so uh, the light that we're getting, we can be pretty sure is mostly coming from actual pairs of photons that are created at the exact same time in this BBO crystal, and uh, which propagate to these this measuring device and these fiber optic cables, and we have to be careful to keep all the path lengths of everything the same because in ten nanoseconds light travels about ten feet, and when you count all the you know this traveling and the fiber optic cable and the electronic cables and everything, you know we're sort of getting close to to ten feet worth of light travel. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's that's the experimental setup. And, and we can verify that as we turn these two uh, these two dials, the the probability that they either both go through the polarizing beam splitter or they both go uh, they both reflect off the polarizing beam splitter, we can verify this probability. So, you know, you you turn turn one knob to a whole bunch of different angles, and then you turn this knob to a whole bunch of different angles independently, and and uh, the 
probabilities depend only on the difference of the two angles. They don't depend on the angles themselves. And they follow that cosine squared pattern. And you might think, OK, a lot of things in physics follow cosine squared. That doesn't seem so crazy. Um, you know, just a single photon itself, we, we talked about uh, with, um, you know, just from vector vector analysis, the if you have it at some some angle, the, the horizontal component is is a cosine, and the intensity is the square of that cosine. And what we measure classically is intensity, and what we measure quantum mechanically is probability, and they better be related. So this doesn't seem that crazy. But let me let me spend a little bit of time motivating why why this is why this is a little bit crazy. Why, why this is why you should be a little bit surprised by this. Uh, so the actual quantum mechanic, oh, the actual quantum mechanical experiment isn't is to get this result isn't that difficult to do with with the standard tools of you know the first few weeks of uh, of big quantum, but to to really understand the implications of why this is exciting, that this will take some work, and that's what I'm going to talk about for most of today. So, so the typical experiment here, this is a schematic version of it. We have a, a source that emits entangled particles. And uh, you can imagine those entangled particles come off at some small angle, but you could put little mirrors to redirect them to go left and right, say. And then we either rotate the, the photons themselves or we rotate this whole, uh, this whole apparatus. And if it goes through, we're going to label that with an O. And if it reflects, we're going to label that with an X. And the probability that we get xx or oo, probably the same thing happens, is cosine squared of the angle difference. So let's consider some some specific cases here. So when when the when the beam splitters here are in the same orientation, uh, we always get perfect correlation. So 50% of the time we get oo, 50% of the time we get xx, but the the probability that we got the same result is is one. When they're in the same orientation, um, when we put them 90 degrees off, we get uh, we get zero probability that they're the same, right? If I if I were to rotate this whole this whole thing by 90 degrees, or the thing that goes through now is not horizontally polarized photons; it's vertically polarized photons. The thing that reflects is is horizontally polarized. So so now we're always going to get O X or X O. We're always going to get um, opposite things. So we get perfect anti-correlation. And if we orient this thing at 45 degrees, as you might expect, there's just a 50-50 probability that we get the same uh, the same result on both sides, and uh, they're, they're just uncorrelated. And and maybe that makes sense. So, you know, if you just consider these special cases, this doesn't seem that that crazy. And I think the the contribution that that these three people made was to say actually, uh, what what in order to explain these results here, the, the perfect correlation, perfect anti-correlation, and completely uncorrelated, we can't think of the measurement process as being some local physical thing that just happens at, at this beam splitter or, or at this beam splitter in these detectors. Because if that's, if that's what the local measurement process was, then we would never be able to explain this perfect correlation or this perfect anti-correlation. Right? If we send in 45 degree polarized light to this, this beam splitter, it can't be that the photon just makes a local random decision whether to act like a horizontally polarized photon and go through or act like a vertically polarized photon and reflect. Uh, something, something more has to be going on in order to achieve these perfect correlations. Because uh, we, yeah, it, as we rotate this thing through 45 degrees or 90 degrees, uh, we, we can't just explain it with photons acting locally. And, and that, that was their big contribution. So what they suggested was the following. They said, well, maybe, maybe there's something going on under the hood, uh, which, which isn't just local photons making local decisions. But uh, in order to explain these perfect correlations and perfect anti-correlations, maybe, maybe it looks something like this. And here's, here's kind of my version of a simplest schematic explanation of what Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen thought. I said, okay, maybe each photon comes with some, some little pie like this. And, and what these mean 
oh, and, and the entangled photon source creates these, these photons in pairs. And this little symbol here is, is rotated at some random angle. Every time the, every time the entangled photon source uh, creates, creates a pair, it creates one of these things and it rotates at, at some random angle. And then what happens is you, you have your detector on both sides and your detector is oriented at some other angle. And if, if the detector is oriented in the, uh, in the blue region, uh, which I've called plus, it'll, it'll go through say it'll, it'll, it'll register as a horizontally polarized photon. And if it, the detector was oriented in the minus direction, it'll, uh, it'll reflect and it'll be recorded as a vertically polarized photon. And so this explains a lot. This explains those, those three facts. Right? So in the limiting cases, when, when we orient these detectors in the same orientation, you always get the same result. If we orient them 90 degrees differently, Right, if one detector is oriented vertically, the other one's horizontally, no matter how these little pi things are, are oriented, uh, you, you always get opposite results. This one's gonna be in the blue and this one's gonna be in the red or vice versa. And if you, if you have your, your things 45 degrees off, well, it depends on exactly where this angle is, but you can work out that it's, it's just completely uncorrelated, just a 50-50 chance that, uh, that uh, you get the same result. And so this, this seemed like a pretty good explanation. And their explanation of what the, what the, in, what the entanglement is must look something like this. There's, there's some hidden variable, some actual st state of orientation of the photon. And the photon source is creating these things in pairs and sending them out. And every time it creates a pair, it, you know, maybe the pairs are created at some random angle, but it sends them out. And, uh, this would also explain the laptop photons. So if you look at all these photons here, if I imagine orienting my detector vertically for all of these photons here, um, vertical happens to, to pass through blue. And, and I just sort of said blue was the one that passes through the polarizer. And so for all these photons, uh, the light would pass through a vertically oriented polarizer and it would get blocked by a horizontally oriented polarizer. But if the polarizer was oriented at some other random angle, there would be some probability for, for it to go through and some probability for it not to go through. So, so you know, to paraphrase their argument, they said all of this mumbo jumbo about non-local wave functions and wave function collapse, uh, this, is, this is not right. In order to explain these correlations at a distance, you, you just need local physics. And maybe we don't know what that is, quantum mechanics maybe is just describing some, some probabilities of what's going on under the hood, but there's, there really must be something going on under the hood and we just need to figure it out. So that was in 19, the 1930s. Uh, and it took 30 years or so uh, before that, that view was, was uh, overturned. So this is John Bell and in 1964, he published a paper uh, where he, he proved what became known as Bell's theorem and here he's got a similar picture of, of my setup here where you have an entangled source and something that splits the vertical and horizontal polarizations and something that detects the, the photons here. And, and what he said was, all right, maybe in your limiting cases that, uh, that local hidden variable theory works, but if we actually look at what it predicts for, for this kind of experiment, if you actually draw your little pie charts and you send them off at orientations, yeah, you get 100% correlation when they're at the same orientation. You get 0% correlation when they're at different orientations. You get totally uncorrelated 50% uh, correlation when they're in the middle. But uh, no matter how you send off your, your things, um, there is some linear, if you don't know in advance how the, how the detectors are gonna be oriented, uh, you, uh, you send them out, you send out these things randomly and the probability distribution you would get is this green line rather than the quantum prediction, which is this blue line. And, uh, and he, he went on to say, okay, so maybe that simple, that simple picture isn't right, but maybe what about some more complicated thing? You know, maybe the photons are, aren't just these simple wedges, uh, but you know, there's some arbitrarily complicated thing and, and whatever it is, whatever happens on, on the left side is copied over to the right side 
or here, I guess I, I made the inverse on the right side. Uh, and, and they're sent, they're sent out. And, and maybe these aren't even deterministic, right? Maybe these are uh, probabilistic. So instead of having definite blue and red, maybe each wedge is co colored some purple color, which is, uh, represents that when, when this thing hits, hits the, the detector, it should make a probabilistic local decision. And what John Bell said was that no, no, no amount of complicated local anything could, could possibly explain what's going on. So, so Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen's dream of explaining the probabilities of quantum mechanics using these local hidden variables, that's, that's just not right. And it's a little bit complicated to, to really get a gut feeling for why this works. But here's, here's a, a simple game I came up with. Well, I kind of adapted from what other people have used to describe the situation, where hopefully it'll give you a, a rather visceral sense for why, why this is interesting and why entanglement is interesting. So, so here's the game. You, you and your friend are, are in a casino. And in order to play this game, you each go into different rooms. So say this is you and say this is your friend. And the, the casino employee in one room flips a coin and shows it to you. And the casino employee in the other room flips a different coin and shows it to your friend. And based on what you see from the coin, you write down on a piece of paper either X or O. And, uh, and here, that's basically what I just described. And here are the, here's how, how the, the winning works. So, so if the quarters come up like this, as long as they don't come up both tails, then you win the game if you happen to write the same thing on the piece of paper. And if the quarters come up both tails, you only win the game if you write opposite things on the piece of paper. So um, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'll let you think for a minute. What, what is a simple, what is a very simple strategy that allows you to win, you know, most of the time? That you and your friend can can come up with some strategy beforehand. It's like the dumbest strategy you can think of. And how often would you win? No takers. Well, if you if you just decide in advance to just both write X or both write O, uh, then you would win 75% of the time and you would lose 25% of the time. And so uh, that simple strategy allows you to win 75% of the time. So maybe you get $100 if you win and you're charged $80 to play. Uh, that way you the casino still makes money. Uh, but it turns out that Oh, it, it turns out that, that that dumb strategy is the best you can do. So no matter how you how you strategize and how complicated you make it, you end up with the same uh, uh, same highest probability of winning. And so what we find is that two physicists can win more than 75% of the time. They right? can win 85% of the time. And you can mathematically prove that no matter what strategy you come up with, uh, the best you can do is, is to win 75% of the time. So how are these physicists doing it? Well, they're using this, this property of entanglement. So here's, here's how the physicists would do it. Um, Alice would, so, so they, they create a pair of entangled photons and they somehow store them, although that's, that's a little bit, uh, technology isn't quite there yet, but imagine doing this with electrons and some, uh, or, uh, atoms in some trap uh, that they bring into the casino. If, if Alice sees ahead, she will measure her photon at zero degrees and either it will go through her polarizer or it will reflect. If she sees a tail, she'll rotate her, her photon or she'll rotate her, uh, her uh, beam splitter 45 degrees. And, and Bob will do the same thing, except his angles are, are off by a little bit. His angles are off by 22 and a half degrees. And in either case, uh, each person will write down zero if the photon passes through, 
or x if it's if it's absorbed and we can go look up how often they get the same result in each of the cases so in the case of two heads alice holds her polarizer at zero degrees and bob holds his at 22 and a half degrees 22 and a half is half of 45 and uh and we can look up what's the probability that they they both write x or they both write o and it's 85 percent so they they win the game 85 percent of the time and same thing for the other case heads tails bobs is at minus 22 and a half degrees cosine is symmetric so it's the same thing uh, in the case of tails heads where we had 45 degrees and 22 and a half degrees uh, again the difference is 40 is 22 and a half degrees so they uh, don't get the same result 85 percent of the time and how about that last case where where we we found it hard to to win well with tails alice holds hers at 45 degrees and with tails bob holds his at minus 22 and a half degrees and here the separation between the angles is 67 and a half degrees and so uh, the probability of getting the same answer at 67 and a half degrees is 15 percent and so the probability of getting a different answer, which is what you need to win, is again, 85%. So no matter how the coins come up, uh, when, when the two people make their measurements in this way, they'll win 85% of the time. And this is better than the, the best strategy that you could possibly come up with uh, classically. Even if you allowed yourself to, to have uh, some probabilistic strategy. Uh, so, so the physicists are always winning the game around 85% of the time. And so uh, this, this example here of, of, uh, of this game can be, can be kind of used to prove Bell's theorem that says, you know, if maybe if photons come with some instructions to do in each case, which is what Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen wanted, and those instructions are just randomly assigned so that the probability of the same thing happening is, is cosine squared of the difference of the angle. So Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen said, we could probably come up with a scheme that makes this happen. And Bell's theorem says, no. Even this scheme, no matter how complicated you make your hidden variables, no matter how complicated you make those little pie charts, uh, there's, uh, there's no way of, of achieving this with that method. And so, so how are the photons doing it? Well, we, we don't know is the basic answer. And there's a couple, you know, quantum mechanics doesn't say, it just says that they do it with certain probability. And so there are certain, certain ways the photons could be doing it. And we want to arrange experiments to rule out those, those ways. And so uh, one, of the, one of the loopholes, one of the ways that the photons could be cheating is, is if they were communicating to each other uh, what, what they each saw in terms of their measurement. And certainly in the lab setup, this is possible, but uh, what we want to do for, for uh, a real version of this is to separate the measurements by as, as much as possible and make them as simultaneous as possible so that no communication can happen even at the speed of light and uh, between the, the measurements on one side and the measurements on the other. And another possibility that could be happening is maybe what happens is they decide in advance, okay, uh, if, if you see tails just just quit, just ask for a refund and walk out. If that was allowed, you could win the game more than 75% of the time. And so to build experiments that combat that, we have to use extremely efficient detectors that basically don't allow you to quit the game. And finally, there's, there's one kind of weird one, which is maybe the photons can somehow predict or influence uh, what, what basis is chosen. You know, in the lab, it seems like you could set your, set your polarizers to be whatever you want. But maybe that's not really as free as you think, or, or more, maybe more reasonably, uh, the photons can kind of predict what, what, uh, what's going to happen there. And, and, and that's like you're able to bribe or uh, predict what, how the dealer is going to flip his coin. And so very sophisticated experiments have been set up to test some of these things. And in 2017, uh, the Chinese launched this Misius satellite, which beamed down entangled photons uh, to two different ground stations that were separated by 1,200 kilometers. And they still saw that there was, that there was entanglement uh, between, between pairs of, of stations. So as, as the satellite flew over China, they would generate entangled photons on board. 
and, and beam down photons to uh, these two different stations that were separated by quite a bit. And as the photons were be being beamed down, right at the last instant, there was some local, local kind of quantum random number generator, local very fast random number generator they were using to, to determine how to orient their polarizer. And you can do this electronically. So you know, it takes uh, milliseconds for the light to come down from space, but in a few nanoseconds, you can create a, a random number and electronically rotate a polarizer. Uh, and so at the very last instant, they, they, they did this and they still saw that the quantum mechanical result held as, as was expected by everyone. But that rules out this explanation that somehow they're able to uh, communicate slower than the speed of light with each other in order to, to cheat at this game. Uh, and so one of the experiments that I was involved in was to replace those local quantum random number generators with these astronomical random, gener random number generators. So we looked at distant quasars. And this was the, 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 the device I showed you at the very beginning. We looked at distant quasars and looked at whether the next photon emitted from this quasar was a little bit redder or a little bit bluer than average. And hopefully nothing can influence or predict that because it happened so far away and information about that next photon emission that's gonna end up inside of our telescope that hasn't reached us yet. And so uh, we were able to orient the, uh, uh, orient the polarizer at the last instant based on the light from the quasars. And this summer, I'm working with some, some research students doing a version of this experiment that doesn't involve just straight uh, entanglement measurements, but involves something called the quantum eraser, which is uh, another experiment that you can perhaps perform in an advanced lab, if you so choose, involving quantum particles. So that is it for today. I will stop sharing the screen. And uh, that is it for, for optics lab lectures. So uh, if any of you have any questions, I, I'm happy to take it, although I think we have to go in a few minutes. But uh, I, I'm happy to chat online or offline. I will be around, oh, I guess I'll end the video there.